Coming to you from Studio A at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. There's no shrub substitute for this show. That's true. <laughs> it's the Gardening <laughs> Simplified Show with Stacy Hervella, me, Rick Weist, and our engineer and producer, Adriana Robinson. All right, so Stacy, Adriana, and I have the privilege and pleasure of getting to interact with all kinds of people across the United States, into Canada, and around the world. And one Gardening Simplified Show listener sent us a note. Can you discuss the basics of getting a plant established? It's fun to select new plants, but if they don't make it through the first winter, it can be discouraging, causing one to trim back expectations by planting less in the coming season. For those of us learning as we go, getting plants established can turn out to be a bit of a steep learning curve. You know, I was thinking about this and thinking some people always seem to be in the right place at the right time. And uh, I'd like to tell you that from my experience as a person, it's not just because they're lucky. Uh, for people, they prepare. It's not just about proximity. These people have prepared for the moment. They shadow. They're willing to serve. They're consistent. They show up and show up well. And then they take a shot. Well, if you're going to take a shot with your plants, First of all, you got to make sure that they're in the right place at the right time to give them that opportunity to grow. Building is like, well, planting is like building a structure, okay? you got to have a plan. You should have a plan, some sort of plan, uh, if you're going to do it. You need to establish a foundation on the plot of your choosing, and the aesthetics will come later. So there is an element of planning that goes along with putting a plant in the ground. Well, there is, not least of all, because you do have to consider what your conditions are, your light conditions, your soil conditions. And so you at least need to have that in mind right. before you start picking those plants. And, you know, I know personally, as you do, the heartache of falling in love with something only to find out it won't do well. It either gets eaten by deer or your soil's too dry or it's not hardy, usually, is my situation. <laughs> um, but, yeah, you have to you have to be prepared yeah. So a plant is established when the roots have grown into the surrounding soil and there's a bit of new growth on the branch tips. So a gentle tug is going to tell you when the roots are established. And if you've made good plant choices, odds are you're going to be successful. I like to use a few different examples, Stacy. One example that I would use, and for our YouTube viewers, you'll see this in studio for those listening to the podcast or radio. I'm putting a wine glass on the center of the table. Oh, that wasn't as uh, impressive <laughs> as I thought it might be. Sorry. I was trying to give our radio listeners a little sound effect. Yeah, that doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Probably should have practiced that beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, that wine glass to me represents a tree. Let's say we're trying to establish a tree. Now, many people think roots go deep into the soil, and they don't. It has a flared look, the tree does, similar to a wine glass. And so it's extremely important to prepare the soil properly for whatever plant you're putting in the ground, trees or shrubs, because roots need oxygen just as much as they need water and minerals. And they are going to flare out from the base of the plant. There's going to be structural roots that hold that plant in place. But Stacy, what we're trying to encourage are what we would call adventitious roots that are working their way into the soil profile. And uh, those are the roots that are going to really do the work in establishing that plant by absorbing the minerals, uh, the water, and uh, taking care of feeding that plant. Right. So two things there. Um, I think a lot of people, you know, you're either hiking in the woods or driving uh, along the expressway and there a storm had gone through and you see those trees uprooted and they took a huge chunk of earth with it. And a lot of people probably see that and think, wow, that tree wasn't rooted that deeply. That's probably why it fell. And that's not the case. Plants don't actually grow as deep as many people think that they do for the simple fact that oxygen does not penetrate that deeply beyond about 18 inches in the soil. And exactly. roots actually need oxygen. So, yes, they are going to go somewhat deeper, but it's not like, you know, when you see those trees, there's something wrong with them. They just, they were in the wrong place at the wrong time and the exactly. wind happened to to blow them over. But, you know, this this concept of establishment is so important because I think 
very few people fully uh, understand or realize that a plant can only grow on top as much as its root system can support. And so after you plant something, you don't see a lot of growth. And we definitely hear from people who are like, oh my gosh, I planted, you know, fill in the blank here and it hasn't grown and what's wrong and what am I doing wrong? And I'm a horrible plant parent. And no, that just because you aren't seeing the growth above ground doesn't mean there's not a whole, whole lot of activity underground. And exactly. until that root system is in place, the plant is not going to have the resources to devote to a lot of that top growth, to devote to a lot of flowering, to devote to a lot of color development, fruit development, whatever that ornamental feature is. It's really important just because we don't see the roots to understand that they really do control the growth of the plant. Yeah, exactly. You need to, you need to look down and out first, not down and out as in feeling depressed, but down and out uh, because we need that root establishment. I was reminded of it this past week when there was a group of ladies at the greenhouse that approached me and said, hey, I bought these hardy mums last year and they're supposed to be perennials, but none of them came back. And, you know, I can guarantee, I always tell people with hardy mums, once they're done late October, November, cut them back, but leave some stubble on them, a little mulch over the top, uh, because if you don't, those plants aren't well rooted in the ground. When you've put them in the ground, they'll push up or heave out of the ground and you'll lose the plants, those fine roots. So it's about establishment in the soil, having a good foundation. You're not going to build a house that does not have a good foundation. Let me give you a quick limerick on this subject. My gardening skills have astounded by beautiful plants. I'm surrounded. Don't tell me I got lucky because my plants are plucky. We just make sure we're well grounded. So and that's true. the key, right? Yeah, so absolutely. True. Yeah, so competition in nature. So I don't care if you're putting a house plant in some soil indoors or a tree in the ground or a flowering shrub or some perennials. That uh, seasonal timing along with good soil establishment as well as, as we talked about, oxygen for the roots is going to make a, a world of difference uh, for your plants. Now, Stacy, you'll see a lot of these starter fertilizers out on the market, like vitamin B1. Mm -hmm. And there are many people who think that's just silly, doesn't work. Other people who swear by. I mean, what's your position on using a starter fertilizer? Um, my position on using a starter fertilizer is that it's not typically needed. Okay. Um, first of all, because especially when you're buying something, you know, new from the greenhouse or nursery, it has been fertilized within an inch of its life. You know, they're fertilizing it regularly. Uh. It had a time. <laughs> <laughs> it had a time release fertilizer like Osmocote or whatever incorporated into the soil. And so its nutrient needs are really, really well covered. And adding a bunch of stuff to the soil when the plant is doesn't necessarily have the root system to take them up mm -hmm. is just kind of a waste. Things can leach out. Um, but I get I get the, I, the idea that people feel like they want to make a perfect little home for their new plant. And I think that's a very good approach to take to it. But I just think that the answer doesn't always lie in buying something for said beautiful, cozy home for your new plant. It really just results in, it's really just a matter of taking the right steps so that the plant can live. So mm. they're, they're not usually harmful. And we've talked about mycorrhiza before and my approach to, and those are very often a part of starter fertilizers. Sure. And my viewpoint on mycorrhizae is they are absolutely great, but adding them to your soil is unlikely to work because they're a living thing. And if you don't have the right conditions, all any mycorrhizae you add is going to die. And if you have the right conditions, they're already in there anyway. It's, it's similar to like the, the vitamins or the phosphorus thing. You can overdo it just because it's not necessarily that more is yep, better. There is a, a, a sort of stasis there. Um, of how much a, a soil can hold in terms of nutrients, in terms of other supplements like B1 or mycorrhizae. Yeah, that's true. You can buy a beautiful car, but if there's no engine under the hood, it's not going to function well. So roots not only anchor the plant, but again, the adventitious roots are going to reach into that parent soil where you've placed this plant and give that plant a good feeding foundation. Stacy, I wanted to mention for our listener who also reached out to us on this establishment issue, I have found many times pruning and pinching also important in the initial establishment of a plant. In other words, when you buy a 
beautiful plant at the garden center. The garden center wants this thing to look beautiful. Why? Full of flour, because you're going to buy it impulsively, right? But sometimes pinching or pruning, I'll often do that when I put ant flowering annuals in the ground. Mm -hmm. I'll pinch them first because we want to focus on that root establishment and we want the top growth to be proportionate to the root system. Does that make sense? It does make sense because what you're basically saying is, is, is you know, thinking about things as roots growing in proportion to the top. The top that you have is proportional to the root mass, but if you take away some of that top, now you have more root mass than you need, and that will help it get more established. It can put its more more of its energy into growing those roots instead of just growing up, 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 up. Um, yeah, I, I understand that's a difficult process for people to pinch beautiful new plants that they just got. So I don't think it's imperative, but it can be a good idea, and if you believe that that's what you need to do, then I say by all means do it. Sure, and that's why last week when we talked about fall is for planting – because the soil is warm, but the plant isn't putting all that energy into top growth, right. it may be a good time for you to try to establish plants in the landscape. Coming up later on today's show, segment four, Branching News, we're going to talk gardening trends, which oh, yeah. will be a lot of fun. Gardening trends that you have to look forward to in 2024. But first... Plants on Trial. Stacy's going to introduce us to a beauty. You don't want to miss this. That's coming up next here on the Gardening Simplified Show. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. You know, we were just talking about plants getting established, and it's uh, I had to I have to deliver some news to you, Rick, uh -oh. about plants getting established. I was thinking of you in the garden. I happened to walk by my cannas that oh, you yeah. gave me at the end of the season. Looking fabulous. Absolutely love them. The hummingbirds are going crazy. We'll never be without them again. But uh, these puppies busted through the fiberglass container that I have them planted in. Wow. I was walking by and I was like, something caught my eye. I said, what is that? And they incredible hulked it right out of that <laughs> container. Talk about plant <laughs> establishment. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And I, I did overplant them in the container, but you know, that's easy to do because you got these canna rhizomes, you got a big, right. you know, I had like a big 22 inch container. I'm yeah. like, oh yeah, I'll just pack them in there. It'll be fine. Now they're huge and so strong and they've grown with so much force that they have actually broken the side of the container. Wow. A root awakening. <laughs> it is. I, I, and I mean, the container is destroyed, but I'm also sitting here wondering how in the world I'm going to get these things out of here. That is great. When they have filled it so abundantly. So just accept compliments on their robust growth. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, it's, uh, they are robust. I will say that. And speaking of robustness, we were just talking about establishing plants and, you know, I always like to tie the plant on trial to whatever we're talking about. And so as I was thinking about which one we're going to put on trial today, I said, this could go either way. I could choose a plant that's slow to get established or a plant that's fast to get established. Mm -hmm. But then I said, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we covered Sweet Summer Love Clematis as our plant on trial. And that is a plant that, as I said during that segment, is definitely slow to get established. The plant, the clematis, they have really thick, fleshy roots. It just takes a lot of energy for them to grow enough of them to perform well and grow a lot on top. So I said, you know what? No, I'm going to go opposite. I'm going to talk about a plant that's fast to get established. And that plant is Kodiak Orange Dervilla. Natalie Carmoli here at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs got me excited about this plant. I put it in my landscape. I love it. Yeah, it's a great plant. Now, I will say for everybody who's listening at home um, that it is not the showiest of the Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. Sure. This is, And that's okay. That's a good thing. I mean, if every single plant in our garden is showy, you don't know where to look because everything's you know, popping off and going crazy. So this is going to be one of those quieter plants um, that you use, maybe incorporate into your landscape. I have several. And so Dervilla is a, a North American native shrub. In fact, here in Michigan, you'll see it growing all over Mackinac Island and in many places up north. Uh, it is a member of the honeysuckle family. And as such, it has very tidy opposite foliage. So the leaves are arranged opposite one another on the stems. And it just has like a very neat clean look and the new growth uh the new foliage growth emerges a really really nice orange it gets really nice red orange fall color 
And then all through the summer, it puts out these small yellow flowers that attract uh, a lot of different pollinators, especially bumblebees. So, um, you know, it, and it gets to be about three to four feet tall. So it's kind of one of those plants where you might just say like, Yep, it's a plant, but it really has this subtle color that I think helps it blend so nicely with other things. I think the orange goes great with brick homes, which sure. can also often be very difficult uh, to landscape. And of course, is in terms of the establishment, this is a very tough and very durable plant. I find it to be drought tolerant. It's, yeah, so that was my experience too. So, you know, as we've said, we both garden in really sandy mm -hmm. soil, dunes, uh, a dune sort of environment. And um, I have, and I'm, and I'm not suggesting that you do this, listeners, watchers, however you're joining us on Gardening Simplified, um, I have transplanted it in the middle of the summer. And I swear this thing did not miss a beat. Wow, that's it's, fantastic. And, and they have, um, their roots are, uh, you know, like a pretty much a regular shrub root kind of system. They do have sort of almost like a, a runner. Now they're not, they aren't like a suckering shrub. They do sucker a bit, um, but really they mostly stay kind of within the plant body. And these vigorous suckers are what help it get established so quickly. It just is really able to grow those roots very quickly and get established. So you start enjoying that color, enjoying good growth, enjoying that flowering a lot sooner. You're not waiting you know, the typical establishment time frame, which usually we say is two to three years. Yeah. If you're keeping score at home, you want to Google it. Uh, we're talking about Kodiak Orange Dervella. At least, Stacy, you called it Dervella. I've always called it Deervella. And I planted it because allegedly it's kind of deer resistant. It's kind of deer resistant. It's kind of, isn't <laughs> it's kinda, it? That was a good way to say it. It's yeah, kind of deer resistant. Yeah, they nibbled on the flower. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So I find that the deer do nibble it a bit, especially in spring, um, which is very common. A lot of things that are otherwise deer resistant, you know, they come out of winter, they're super hungry. Anything that is, you know, first out and has that tender new growth, they're like, yeah, I'm eating it. I need a salad. I'm tired of all this bark. Um, and <laughs> so they do nibble it a bit, but overall I, they don't seriously damage it. So okay. they do eat it a bit, but not to the point where you're like, oh That's my gosh, I've I have discovered. nothing left. Yeah. Um, so it's just something to keep in mind if you have deer. I find that the damage does taper off, you know, by summer when the growth uh, gets a little bit more, uh, you know, tough and, and woody rather than that really super soft spring growth, which they really, really like. Uh, so this plant, uh, this Kodiak Orange Dervilla, was developed by a gentleman by the name of Mike, I, don't, I hope I don't mispronounce his last name, Ucknit. Ucknit? Yeah, that looks right. And uh, you may not know his name, but I can almost assure you that you have grown some of his plants. Now, he's not normally a woody plant breeder. His most uh, impressive breeding introductions have been annuals. Mm. And one of them is wave petunia. Oh, my. Yeah. Now, you know, that's a huge one. Obviously, wave petunias are not a, the proven winners petunias. We have the super tunias. Wave petunia is a different brand, but it has a similar um, sort of idea behind it, that it doesn't need deadheading, that it's very, very vigorous, uh, much more heat tolerant than the older variety. So he was on the team that developed wave petunias, and he is also the person who developed all of the fabulous dragon wing begonias that are so popular right now. Mm. So, Interesting. so some serious breeding chops. Uh, this is one of his earlier forays, I think, into woody plants. Um, but we're really grateful to have it. And again, it's a simple plant, but I think it's it's a really nice one to. You, it can make a nice hedge. It could make even a, a taller edging. A good screening plant. Um, I include it in my native plant you know, borders. So it just kind of intermixes with all of my different native perennials. Uh, it does not need pruning, but you can prune it if you want. So in our trial gardens, uh, they do often prune it to kind of keep it a little bit more uh, compact and shaped. So if you prefer that look, this can easily withstand pretty much as much pruning as you want to give it. I do prefer more of the natural, taller look, so I do not prune mine. Another thing, great thing about Dervilla is that it is quite shade tolerant. Um, and certainly when you see it in the wild, it's growing in sort of the edges of woods where it's, it's typically quite shady. And um, if you grow it in too much shade, now the, the orange part of Kodiak orange will be a little less orange. The plant will probably be a little bit more green. But, you know, sometimes I think... 
you know, knowing if you have a lot of shade, just knowing what to expect, knowing that it will live, but maybe just not do, you know, the best, not have as many flowers, not have as bright of an orange foliage and certainly not have as good fall foliage. You know, plants like this are often a good choice when you have a situation like I do where my front is half sun and half shade. Right. So you want some That's symmetry. What I have mine in. Yeah, yeah, it's a common thing, yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. So you want some symmetry, you want some cohesion, but what are you going to do when one side is very, very sunny and one side is very shady? Well, you get a plant like this or boxwood that can really take either of those conditions and then that kind of gives it that cohesiveness um, that that people really like. Yeah, it's fantastic. Did a little research, uh, Stacy. the plants named, uh, or, or der, dervella or dervella, whatever you want to ca call it, plants named after a French surgeon from the 1700s, Dr. Marin Dierville. Hmm. He was a botanist, a travel writer, and a French surgeon. Wow, busy guy. He was oh. a busy guy. <laughs> a real Renaissance man. It's a very fancy plant. Now, I do use <laughs> the name Dervilla to describe this plant. I don't like its common names. Yes. The, the most popular common name that you will see on this plant is bush honeysuckle. Right. And I don't like that because um, it's, it, it's in the honeysuckle family, as I already said, but a lot of people, they hear honeysuckle and they immediately think, whoa, invasive, right. not going to grow it. And this right. is not an invasive plant. It's not going to self-sow all over just because it's in the family um, doesn't mean that it is. And in fact, the flowers aren't fragrant, which is what most people expect from a honeysuckle. So it's not going to be doing that either. So that's why we use the common name Dervilla to refer to this excellent native plant. You can see pictures of it on our website, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com, or in another place that you might frequent, Instagram, because Gardening Simplified Yay. now has an Instagram account, Gardening Simplified Show, if you are there, and we will be featuring the plant on trial every week, so you don't have to go far to find out and see it if you happen to listen to us on radio. We're going to take a little break. When we come back, we're opening up that gardening mailbag, so please stay tuned. Greetings, gardeners, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It's time where we open up the garden mailbag and answer questions from gardeners across the country, and in fact, often around the world. And um, if you are a fan of the garden mailbag, like hearing about other people's problems in the garden and <laughs> our answers to them, um, we are actually going to do an extra. We're going to do a bonus episode of Just Garden Mailbag Questions. Ooh. Uh, I know, you know, I've, we've had a lot of questions and they're all important, but when we can only do three in a show, that makes it really hard to like get to everybody. And so we're going to do a special episode of just Q and A. This is going to be fun. I see London. I see France. I see problems with your plants. That's why we're here. <laughs> I was really wondering where that was going, right? <laughs> That's where it went. So the the uh, it came out. <laughs> the the all mailbag uh, episode is not going to be here on the radio, but it will be on your favorite podcast platform as well as on YouTube. So please check us out there if you would like to see that. You can also visit gardeningsimplifiedonair.com and you can find it there. So what's in the mailbag today? All right, Shirley writes to us one. How does one prune a Wolf River apple tree to bear fruit? Our other apple trees fruit out, but we do not get fruit from the Wolf River tree. All the apple trees were planted in 2017. They've got multiple apples and crab apples, so pollination shouldn't be an issue. Uh, they failed to see blossoms in spring. They just want to make sure that it's being pruned correctly. Right. So um, I think, now I don't know, I'm not an apple expert by any stretch. Now I did read that Wolf River apple was developed in Wisconsin, so yes. should have good hardiness. But I do wonder if there's something about the actual sighting of this tree or something else where the blooms are getting frosted off every year. That's my suspicion. It's a hardy what we'd call antique tree. You're right. Wolf River, Wisconsin, 1875 and super hardy super cold hardy so um it's hard to figure out what's going on here uh, with this tree but i would tell you that i did a little research when i saw this question and i see people out there with the same problem oh really some saying it's been six years there were a few that said it's been 12 years so i'm not so sure it's anything shirley's doing wrong i'm sure you're doing it right shirley um and i would tend to agree with you stacy that number one it takes a while to establish to fruiting size and number two 
boy, those spring blooms, maybe we're losing them. Right. And, you know, it could be that it just blooms earlier and they're getting, you know, killed off by late frost. You know, it's it's sort of one of those situations, not unlike big leaf hydrangeas, hydrangea macrophylla, where yes, the plant is hardy, but are those flower buds as hardy as the plant itself? I don't, I don't know. I'm not an apple expert, but that would be my suspicion that it is some sort of weather condition. And um, I know that doesn't make things easy. You've already got a bunch of time into your Wolf River apple um, but it definitely sounds like Shirley knows what she's doing she knows about pollination she knows about pruning if she's getting fruit on her other trees um, and you know maybe this one is just obstinate I think it's going to take a little time I really do uh, Shirley also has a question what makes leaves on pear trees cup up we have one young pear tree that has cupped leaves it's planted near other pear trees that seem Perfectly healthy. Uh, There's no obvious sign of insects or fungus treated with neem oil, fertilized the trees. It's just not thriving and dropped its fruit in early summer. I would say, Stacy, that if it dropped fruit in summer, early summer, some fruit drop, and uh, the leaves are cupping, sometimes that that is a water indication Mm -hmm. uh, with a pear tree. If there's no evidence of insects or disease... It could be a water issue in that spot. Yeah. You know, when a plant doesn't have enough water, it's like, whoa, it can't support all this fruit. There you go. Don't need you anymore. I'm I'm going into survival mode, not fruit ripening mode. And, you know, even if you have a a situation like Shirley does where you have a number of trees and other ones are healthy, there can be so many different factors that Mm -hmm. aren't visible to the eye, whether it's underlying bedrock or another tree that's not even necessarily super close to it that is out competing it for water and you know when i researched this question did i find a host of answers or potential explanations i saw drought stress nutrient deficiency herbicide drift fungal diseases like anthracnose pests like the pear leaf curling midge yes so surely uh suffice it to say we cannot give you any one answer but we can give you some uh guidance and so i would say this is definitely a great situation for your local cooperative extension you know i think that they're especially valuable when it comes to fruit because that's one of the the things that they really specialize in and if you do want to dive into it more online i'm going to repeat my best advice for searching and finding reliable information on the internet which is simply to type in your terms, you know, pear cupping leaves or pear weird foliage, however you want to say that, and then type in site, S-I-T-E, colon dot E-D-U. And that will limit your results to just university websites that are based on research. And you don't have to weed through that, you know, with every person who has a gardening blog, you know, throwing out what they think it might be. You're actually finding some reputable information that you can hopefully use and put into action to uh, improve that pear. Yeah, if it's a curling midge or disease, you're probably going to see it on the foliage, maybe browning margins or whatever it may be. If those leaves are green and cupping, we've got to go down a different road. Yeah. So, yeah. All right, Karen writes to us, uh, Japanese beetles, big problem for Karen. Do you foresee new cultivars that will be Japanese beetles resistant? If you can now buy roses that are disease resistant, why not come up with ideas for resistance to beetles? Yay. Good question, Kim. (laughs) It's such a good question. And um, I can certainly see why people would be like, well, gee, if you can accomplish all these other things, and we do talk a lot about what plant breeding can accomplish, like why can't it do this? And um, so I thought about it. And, you know, a lot of disease resistance does occur at the genetic level. And if something is controlled by a plant's genes, which disease resistant, not just plants, but humans are very often their, their genes control whether they are more susceptible or less susceptible to certain diseases diseases, um, plant breeders can work with genes. They can identify which gene is causing the problem. They can work on modifying that gene or changing it or reducing its prevalence in the parentage by through selective breeding and induce that disease resistance. Now, insect resistance is quite another story because no plant is necessarily born resistant to insects. And insects are, you know, basically non-discriminating feeders. They're just like, I'm on this thing, take a little bite, tastes pretty good, I'll eat some more. And if they like it, they call others to join the party. It becomes right. a mess. The, because the plant will start to emit hormones right. like, hey, I'm in stress. And the insects are like, whoa, looking for some stressed plants to eat. Here you are. This is fantastic. Party time. Party time. And uh, so that makes it more difficult. Now, we do know that Japanese beetles do tend to prefer 
roses that have thinner foliage. So roses that have thicker, glossier, more mm. leathery foliage are definitely less preferred by Japanese beetles. But I would not go so far as to say they are Japanese beetle resistant because what I think would happen since Japanese beetles love roses so much is that say you said, okay, you find this rose, someone says, hey, this is Japanese beetle resistant. You take out all your other roses, you put this new, you know, supposedly Japanese beetle resistant rose in, they they love roses, they're just going to eat it. Yeah. You know, just because you don't see them on it doesn't mean that they won't eat it. They're opportunistic. So it's a lot harder, even though we can, can select for certain qualities that are less appealing to insects, testing for it, ruling out all the possibilities as to why it might have been eaten less one year than than other roses is unfortunately nearly impossible. So in the meantime, just keep smashing those Japanese beetles. Tell your friends to do the same. And maybe eventually, if we all pitch in, we'll manage to control uh, we'll get it. There. I'm a dreamer. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, with roses, it's the aromatic oils in the flowers. And uh, yeah, you know, you're going to have that. The, the beetles just love them. So and the larvae become adults and just start feeding on roses. Yeah. They're tired of being grubby. <laughs> I don't know. Hey, a question from Cleopatra McCaleb. Love that, Isn't that name, a great name, Cleopatra. That's fabulous, and I hope I pronounced it right. I've ordered from you before, loved what I receive. Why can't I go online and order from you anymore? I have the Gardening Simplified issue number nine, and I love it. So this is such a great question, and I can answer it pretty quickly. Now, I do want to say Gardening Simplified is the name of our show. It's also the name of the landscape guide that Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs puts out every other year. So we just had one that came out this past year. That's the one, yep. Um, and so that is not a catalog of things that you can order. It's a look at all of our plants. But all Proven Winners shrubs are actually sold in garden centers or online. And okay. so we don't sell them directly. So where we come here in this Studio A from Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs, we are not a place where you can actually buy them. Instead, you actually have to go to your local garden center. So even though a booklet like Gardening Simplified will tell you what we have so you can go look for it at your garden center, it's not some place that you can order from. And if you can't find what you want at your local garden center, please do ask them. They can usually order what you want from the person who supplies them with Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. Now, we have got a guest waiting for branching news, so please stay tuned. Welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It's time for branching news and excited about today. We're going to talk about Garden Trends 2024 and talking to Katie Dubal. Katie is the second president of the Garden Media Group, a women-owned and run public relations firm that specializes in the home and garden industry, celebrating more than 30 years of business. And they author an annual garden trends report i love reading this report every year and it's around this time of the year that the report comes out now katie travels the world scouting and presenting garden trends to audiences from italy to chicago katie lives in westchester pennsylvania and her goal is to convince people that brown thumbs can in fact be turned green. Boy, that seems like a good mission to me, Katie. <laughs> Welcome to the Gardening Simplified Show. Thanks so much, Rick. Good to be here. It's great to have you on the show. And talking garden trends for 2024, and I had the opportunity to see you speak in Ohio earlier this year. Uh, the seven trends, if I'm correct, that you are releasing this year are buying power, hortifuturism, delight in the dark, bugging out, hanging in there, nature calls, and a color of the year. So let's dive into that and uh, maybe start with buying power. Who's buying all these plants out there in 2024? Oh, sure. Yeah. So I love the way our trends, just for those of you who I know you'll, you'll plug how to download it, but um, at gardenmediagroup.com backslash trends. But the way that we've done it this year is that you actually pick a persona that works for you. So as you go through them, you'll see different words. So the words for buying power are digital, influential, and humble. And we call them the Zoomer generation. So Gen Z, and it's a little play on words for the boomers. Um, but interestingly enough, all of the data shows that Gen Z is buying houses ahead of generations before them. 
So they have uh, greater percentages, 30% actually, of that 25-year-old group now own their home compared to 27% of Gen Zs or Gen Xers and 28 of millennials of that same age. So they're ahead of the curve there in buying their homes, which, as we know, in the landscape, horticulture, green industry, is great for us because when you're investing in your home, you're investing in your landscape. But there's another little new thing here that we're looking at is that old pandemic, and because this generation in particular has worked from home for a big chunk of their career, they're willing to spend more money on things around the home. So they want that fancy stand-up desk and that real ergonomic chair, but they also are willing to invest more in their landscape and the products that go along with that landscape, containers, pre-made containers. Um, you know, plants and things that go outdoors, plus, of course, the things that spruce up their office indoors. Right. You got to have a good Zoom background for all those uh, remote meetings you can have <laughs> outdoors. Impress them with your garden. Exactly. Is this a group, uh, Katie, uh, I recall within the trends, you talking about echo anxiety. Um, is this yeah. a group that experiences this or is this everybody in general that drives us to put more plants in the ground and enjoy gardening the way we do? No, you're right. That 67% of Americans 18 to 23 experience that eco anxiety. And I have a lot of teachers in my family from, you know, preschool up to the college level. And when I was telling them about the trends report, they all really identify with the fact that their young students experience this kind of hopelessness that they feel like what have we been handed who like why would you hand this terrible climate down to us and what can we do about it so you're right that this generation's experience is kind of this lackluster attitude about what can we do and so one of our overarching trends is called eco-optimism and that's what the whole report is about all of our trends tie back to that and we really hope that, you know, part of the, the mantle of us as horticulturists, as scientists, as landscapers, communicators, is that we spread the positive news about the joy that gardening can bring. And all the other data that's great out there, there's really positive data and climate facts, real science-based facts that, that things are happening in a positive way. But of course, that's not the sensational thing that the media wants to report. So right. we really urge a lot of you know, all of the, the companies out there to be those harbingers of that positive news. Is that part of the reason, uh, Katie, that there's so much interest in insects and pollinators? Also, there certainly seems to be a lot of interest in insects. To be honest, you know, every year we try to put pollinators in our trends. Even though, what is it, five years now, Honey Nut Cheerios took the bee off of the box of Cheerios to raise awareness about the, the decline of pollinators. So it's not really a trend anymore. It's here. People understand that there is insect decline. I've been seeing a meme lately about how to turn your lights out, if you've been seeing that, like different bulbs you can buy that are more insect friendly. So I think that that's kind of more mainstream now. So every year we are challenged to put something in our report that is current, but also that still taps into that passion that people have for insects. Mm -hmm. And this year, the trend is called bugging out. And what we've really seen is a rise of not just bug decor inside, not just, you know, a bug on a, on a um, wall, the taxidermy, classic ones, but really super realistic displays. So the rugs that have these moths and beetles, and they actually look real. They're not that cutesy Honey Nut Cheerios bee anymore. <laughs> and so it's helping people understand that and appreciate, let's hope, that indoors, if they can live with that beetle or live with that moth, they'll be more accepting of it outdoors. Yeah, absolutely. Now tell me about hortofuturism. I'm probably mispronouncing it. But hortofuturism, it, it kind of sounds sci-fi to me. What, what's that all about? Oh, you got it. Exactly. Well, when we do our trend report, you know, we don't just make it up. We do a lot of research. And we look at the, you know, the, the Western markets in China. And you see they reported a 50% year-on-year increase in sci-fi profits on their film and TV. So we say, oh, there's got to be something there. If that market is blowing up in sci-fi, and look at our own you know, the last of us where we're all being eaten by a deadly mushroom and you know, we're fungi. So it's, we are obsessed with that science fiction. But the one thing that we see really different here is when we all picture maybe the future or sci-fi, it has traditionally been a very cold, 
metal, like iRobot style. But actually, when we're seeing these things come to play now, they're filled with color. They're bright and they're bold and they have flowers everywhere. There's a fantastic exhibit that's actually right now happening in Asia. And um, it is um, where you walk through the exhibit. I have a I have a, a cousin who just went to Japan. You walk through the exhibit. It's super immersive. It's called Team Lab. Sorry, I couldn't remember the name. Team Lab. You walk through the exhibit barefoot in six inches of water. Mm. And it's mirrored. But you're surrounded by plants. Every room is different plants. So it's this immersive experience. Philadelphia, Philadelphia Flower Show this year, the Garden Electric, it was a mix of neon floor to ceiling light with horticulture. Um, we're seeing a lot of different displays at garden centers. The South Coast Botanical Garden has an event called Astro Lumina, and it's pushing that envelope of our traditional garden light displays. We all love our holiday light displays at our public gardens, but they're really pushing those boundaries. So we're seeing so many more ways of looking at horticulture that's more futuristic that get that taps into what we're seeing in pop culture, this sci-fi type of attitude and interest. I'm concerned about one of the trends in the report, and that is dark gardens or <laughs> Halloween gardens or Victorian gardens or goth gardening or plants that are like half dead. And <laughs> I, to me, that does not sound like job security for me. I want to help people grow plants. What, what's the deal? Sure. There? sure. Well, this one was actually born out of a conversation that I had with the director of horticulture at the Oakland, uh, Oakland Cemetery down in Atlanta. And her name is Abra Lee, and she's a dear friend of mine. She just recently became their director of horticulture. And she says that you would not believe how cemeteries have become the third space. I'm sure we all know this term. Starbucks coined it. You know, the place, it's not your home, it's not your office. Where do you hang out? And she said you wouldn't believe the number of, we talked about these Zoomers in particular, but the number of people who are walking the cemetery, walking their dogs, taking yoga classes, you know, the cemeteries were once on the outskirts of our modern cities, but as our cities grew, so so did the population, and they engulfed these cemeteries and became these giant, let's say, free public parks in the heart of Atlanta, in the heart of Philadelphia, in the heart of Massachusetts or Boston. So um, they become these third spaces. So I got really into the idea of what people experience as they walk around that cemetery. And what we love about that is, it's not just you're looking at the history to the people, the past, but also the plants. Some of our modern directors of horticulture of these cemeteries are really into tying in historical plants with the people who are buried there, or as they call them in Oakland, the residents. So really we started to research this, this more, I realized that there actually is a big trend right now of people's obsession with kind of this goth. Wednesday, the show Wednesday was a big hit on Netflix. A famous football player did a darkness retreat where he spent two days in complete darkness and silence. You look on TikTok, the skull pasta. It is just across all different types of industries, we had this obsession with darkness. And then I don't know, Rick, if when you were at Cultivate, you noticed lots of dark foliage, oh, yeah. lots of dark plants were being released this year. Um, even at Far West, there was a, a collection of dark foliage plants that was announced, a brand new collection. So the consumer is taking this passion of kind of this darkness and they're it's getting serious. They want more of this dark hued plants, blood red plants, bark peeling on trees, eerie, spooky, not just at Halloween, but they're wanting it all year round. Wow. That's, uh, that's interesting. I visited Cape Cod this past summer and uh, it was fun walking through the cemeteries. Uh, I thought it was very interesting. Same thing uh, in Boston, but I didn't know that I was trendy. I guess as far as dark <laughs> plants are concerned, yeah, you see that on Pinterest also. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I guess sure. it's sure. a trend. Yeah. So uh, hanging in there, uh, hanging baskets, containers, still a, still a hot trend, right? Yeah, we can't ignore the fact that container gardens are huge. The National Gardening Association Survey that it was a 200% increase in people container gardening last year. And when we looked at that number, we thought, Lord have mercy, that is a huge increase. A spend of, what's the spend? $72, point, $72 up from 22, up $22 in the last year. Mm. And this is actually Gen X 
who get often ignored when we talk about, you know, um, generations and demographics, but it's the Gen Xers who are spending the most on containers. But it can't just be containers. Yes, containers are hot. But what we really are looking at here is the way that people are squeezing more plants into their life. So they can't, they can't fit any more on their deck. They can hang plants to maximize the space and the plants in their home. And we love this trend. We love seeing it because, of course, it's, it's healthier for the plants. If it's a vining or trailing plant, it, it has more room to grow, less you know, mold or mildew around it. And then, of course, as a social media star, when you take pictures of your plants, a vertical picture performs better on social than a horizontal picture. So it's going to get more play online. So we just think this trend is here to stay, that people are going to be maximized. You see those memes online. It's like, just a quick trip to the garden center and the trunk is filled with plants and you can't see the person. People want more plants. And this trend we see is just a way to give them more access and more space. I'll tell you what, Katie, don't forget about us baby bloomers also, because uh, we <laughs> like hanging baskets and containers because we don't have to bend over to maintain the plants. Exactly. It's a win-win. Yeah. Easy to water. <laughs> Totally. Stacy, one of the uh, the fabulous flowering shrubs that we talk about on the Gardening Simplify show is limelight and the new oh, introductions yeah. of limelight. And Katie, you're saying that cyber lime and lime is the color lime is uh, vivid, punchy, powerful. Uh, that's a that's a color shades of green and lime for 2024. Correct. Yep. Yep. Well, when we do the research on this, we look at trend forecasting firms and everywhere you turned, it was green, green, green. Okay. And the reason that they cited non-industry related people, right? They said it's because it's harmony with nature. Um, but when we really, we've already picked green and because we're in the industry, we really wanted to hone in on that color and say, well, what shade of green exactly do we think will be trending? And both indoors and out, we think this, this cyber line, because look, we, we talked about 40 futurism. We think these ideas of these bright neons are going to be trending. So it's the brightest green you can get. Um, someone the other day said it reminded them of Kermit the Frog. But I like your lemon, your, your limelight. And, of course, when we talk about houseplants, people always want to know what's trending with houseplants. In, indoors, we see this lime green taking over the pink color um, interiors as well. Mm, interesting. Well, thanks for your time, Katie. Appreciate it. By the way, I want to mention to you that NFL player who spent time in darkness was uh, Aaron Rodgers. Who, Aaron Rodgers. Uh, who went to the New York Jets and last night uh, was injured in his first game, and uh, they're not yeah. so sure he's going to play again this year. So kind of a sad thing wow. for all those New York Jets fans out there. Not me. I'm a Philadelphia Eagles girl all the way. <laughs> That's what I was trying to draw out of you and find out where you stood. Her name is Katie DeBow, and Katie is the second president of Garden Media Group, a women-owned and run public relations firm specializing in the home and garden industry. We appreciate you being out there, Katie, and bringing us up to speed on some of these trends for 2024. Oh, well, you're welcome. Thanks so much for having me. All Thanks, right. Katie. Have a wonderful day. Wow, that was fascinating. Yeah. And that was a lot of information. We couldn't get it all on the radio show. So uh, listen to the podcast or check us out on YouTube if you want to listen to the entire trends report and everything that Katie Dubow has to say about it. In the meantime, we thank you for listening. Thanks to Adriana, for Rick, and wishing you a great week in the garden ahead.